Well, good morning. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, 1 Corinthians 9. I want to say a word real quick before we get there. Uh, I uh, want you to know I'm a what you see is what you get kind of guy. And I had some people questioning me after my Friday email, like, oh, well, we must have a whole lot of division in the church or whatever. No, I, I said right in the email, I was sitting at breakfast thinking about 9-11 and where our country is today. And the, the, what we see is the attack from outside the country unified us. What's going on inside a country is dividing us. And I thought to myself, that's exactly the way it is in the church. Spiritually speaking, it's literally an earthly picture of a spiritual reality. And so that's, that's all I was saying on Friday. There's nothing else, no other kind of agenda. So just wanted to clarify that because I think a lot of people had a question about that. I promise you, Jared Edgecombe is a simpleton. What you see is what you get, okay? So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 15 to 18, we're right in the middle of a section that I've been telling you from 8 to 10, he's talking about idolatry, and in chapter number 8, Paul basically tells him, look, you need to be willing to give up your Christian liberty for the sake of another believer so that you do not cause their conscience to be defiled and them stumble. We, we, that's loving your neighbor. Chapter number nine, Paul is illustrating that principle in his own life. And what Paul is doing, and he's modeling this, and he's not taking, the, the illustration he's giving is that he's not taking any kind of money from the Corinthians because he doesn't want them to be able to say, look, Paul's in it for the money. And, and so he is showing them that what inflames his soul, and my, to be honest with you, my heart is so full between what just thinking about the gospel of Jesus Christ this week, hearing the testimony, listening to the songs, my heart is just full of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what filled his heart and inflamed his soul was that nothing, not even a paycheck, gets in the way of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so in verses 15 to 18 that we're going to look at today, Paul is continuing to explain why he has adopted the strategy with them. And I think what you're going to see this week, and then again when we look at it in two weeks, that he's lifting the lid on the nature and the ministry of the gospel that's going to be very helpful for us in this sermon and the next one when we finish up the chapter. So if you will stand with me, we'll read God's word together. Verse number 15, he says, But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if I do not of my own will... I still, and I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you will fill the, the souls and excite the souls of everyone here today with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Drive it into our hearts, the wonder and the glory and the awe and the majesty of Christ redeemed sinners. Lord, please drive us and impel us to preach the gospel wherever we go, live the gospel wherever we go, and glorify you every moment of our being in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. You know, we have a hard time believing that anything good can be free, right? I mean, I, I do. As a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's in um, youth ministry, I learned very quickly, if you want people to come to something, charge them. Because if it's free, they won't come. Uh, charge them and, and they think it's, there's some value. The Christian message is good news because it's, it's just that. It's It's free. And Paul's whole approach to Christian ministry is designed to help Christians understand 
um, and the Corinthians to understand, to grasp the wonder of the truth of the free gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at three things as Paul works his way through this passage, and I'm not going to go in order of the paragraph. I'm going to, I'm going to hit different parts of it at different times. But the first thing Paul talks about is the substance of his ministry, and that is the preaching of the gospel. Notice that Paul says the substance of it is that this, he had the right to receive financial support from the congregation, but he doesn't exercise that um, right. And look at how he speaks about this work. He sums up his primary task, the burden of all that he had to do there in Corinth in verse number 16. And he repeats it over and over. First, verse 16, verse number 18, he says, If I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. And then he says this, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Look at verse number 18. What does he say there? He says, What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge. Now I have a question for you. What is the purpose of a pastor? What is the purpose for which God gives ministers to his church? Yes, they are to shepherd the flock. Yes, they are to pastor and to care for people. Yes, they are to teach and train disciples. Yes, they are to lead and administer the affairs of the congregation. But what is the overriding priority of faithful ministry? It is not merely preaching. It is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the primary task of the man of God. If the man in the pulpit is not preaching the gospel, he cannot help you. Paul's approach to life and ministry in Corinth is entirely determined by his passionate commitment to delivering this message. Every other concern was subordinated to the preaching of the gospel. Every tool, every technique, every method that he might develop for, for good takes its shape around its relation to the gospel. Every, and so with the church here, every outreach, every ministry, everything that we do needs to shape itself around the gospel of Jesus Christ. The proclamation of the gospel, the good news, is our primary concern. Imagine with me for just a minute. Can I, can I illustrate this with you? Imagine with me for a moment that there's a terrible war going on. A battle has been raging for days, and it's vital that some intelligence be passed from command to the front lines. And so a messenger is to be sent. This messenger does not need to be told how important the news is that he carries and that everything is resting on the delivery of this message, and so he sets off. He has to make his way through enemy lines, and there's really no risk that he will not take, no sacrifice he will refuse to offer, no hardship that he will not endure in order to deliver his message and to fulfill his orders. That is how urgent and how necessary the message of the gospel is for the Apostle Paul. The message that he carries is so vital, so urgent, so necessary that he will surrender everything and give up his rights in order for that gospel to be made known. I think one reason that I... And, and maybe you struggle too to share the gospel has much to do with the fact that I and sometimes you lose sight of really how compelling and glorious and urgent and necessary and pressing the message actually is. That the message of the gospel no longer constrains us and compels us and wells up within us a gospel, or, um, an excitement that we can barely contain. The wonder of it's great, the glory of, it's, of it is so precious to us that we simply have to tell. 
let me ask, has the gospel become passe? Has the good news become old news? Has, has it become like silver that's been left on the shelf and unpolished? It's lost its luster and it sparkles no more and doesn't shine. No wonder we don't share it because we walk right past it dull and then notice as it stays on the shelf. Think about it. Think about this fact. While we were lost and helpless, condemned before God in our sins, he acted for us. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to live the life that we could not live, fulfilling God's law in the place of guilty sinners, dying a death that we could not die, paying perfectly the price, satisfying God's wrath at the cross instead of us. Praise be to God. And now, if we'll only bend our knee to Christ and surrender our claimed autonomy, if we would confess that living on our own terms has always been bankrupt and enslaving and not liberating and freeing as we once thought, if we will come and confess our sins and rebellion and to Jesus, bending our knee to him, our only king, our only hope, our only uh, way of rescue, in that moment, when we do that, full and free pardon will be ours. This life is ready to burst in on you, this new life. There's acceptance before God, a changed heart for you, in the moment that you trust Christ, you have passed from death to life. Think about that wonder. From darkness to life, from the estate of sin and the misery of it into an estate of grace, of abounding and eternal glory, you will be declared righteous in the sight of God and in his heavenly courtroom because Christ's righteousness will be reckoned to your account and you will never, ever again face the possibility of being condemned in God's sight. You will have been adopted into a family, a household of God, made an heir of God, a co-heir of Christ, given all the rights and privileges of a child of God. You will have been born again the old will have gone, the new will have come. Think about this, John mentioned this, the enslaving dominion of sin that once held you in bondage to lust and pride and fear and anger and disbelief and a whole host of other slave driving sins will be broken forever. And God will begin his masterwork in your life of making you a masterpiece, chiseling away at the stubborn block or rough stone in your life. I sometimes tease John, that's part of my job, to chisel away at him, right? That's all our jobs. Sometimes I liken the Christian life to, we're just a bunch of rough stones in a bag, and God's shaking that bag a little bit, kind of knocking off all the rough edges, right? And God is turning us into the moral likeness of a son. He will enable you to die to sin and live to God so that you can say this. So that you can say, by the grace of God in the gospel, today I am not who I once was, and tomorrow I will not be who I now am. I am a child of God inhabited by the Holy Spirit, united by the grace through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, a new creature in him. And though I'm a sinner still and stumble and fall often, I do not lose heart or grow weary in well-doing because I know that I am bound for glory and nothing can separate me from the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our message. Isn't it electric? Oh, that is such an electric message, exciting message that we have. And think about this, we speak through sometimes stammering tongues and stuttering lips this simple good news 
there is a Savior for you in Jesus Christ. And through our message and through this message, Jesus saves sinners. It doesn't matter your presentation. The power is in the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise God. The deaf hear, the blind see, the dead are made alive. And when you see the, the beauty and the wonder and the power of the gospel, how could it leave you how could you leave that sitting on a shelf forgotten? Don't you want to display it for the whole world? Don't you want to say, look, see my Jesus, my Savior, look at what he can do. Don't you want him? That was a great burden on the life of Paul the Apostle and on his ministry. He was so totally captivated by that message that he was willing to forego his monthly wages or whatever from the Corinthian church. You see, that's how the gospel constrains us to hold at bay our liberties so that we can love one another. But I want to show you not only the, um, the substance of his ministry, I want to show you the necessity of his ministry in verses 16 and 17. Look at what he says, verses 16 and 17 with me. He says, necessity is laid upon me Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if, if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with the stewardship. I want you to latch on to that last word. That word is stewardship. Paul is a slave. It's a favorite metaphor of his for the nature of Christian ministry. He's already used it in 1 Corinthians 4 and, and 1, verse number 1, where he says, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ. Remember I ta- told you a couple weeks ago, that word always is slave. We're slaves of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Remember that a steward is a slave serving in a great house. And a steward is a slave specifically tasked with the management and the, of the affairs of the house and the business affairs of the estate. That's what it is. And so we are stewards. We are slaves tasked with the gospel of Jesus Christ and managing that gospel. Paul is saying that's what he is. He's a steward. He's under orders. He's not free, he's a slave, and Jesus is his master. Now there's a little bit in here where um, he, he says, because Jesus Christ laid his commission on his life, he can do nothing else. He's literally not free to do anything else. Look at what he says. Necessity is laid upon me. And then he says, if I do this of my own free will, I have a reward. In other words, I was summoned by Christ to this task. He is the master. I am the slave, his steward. And then he says this. He says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. What is Paul saying? He's saying that if I shirk the responsibility laid upon me by my master, to be the stewards of the mystery of God and to open up the gospel to the nations, then woe to me, judgment will fall upon me. This is the necessity, a compulsion, an irresistible demand. And and I don't have time to go into it now, but he's referring back to the prophetic ministry of Isaiah. Remember that? Uh, Woe to me if I don't preach this message. And the message that Isaiah was preaching actually was, was woe. I have a a growing conviction that this is one of the greatest needs of the church. We need preachers who can do nothing else. We need preachers who can be nothing but servants of the word, 
who feel themselves under divine constraint to preach the gospel and to apply it to our hearts and our lives. And this is what will harness any pastor, any preacher, this will harness whatever native boldness they have inside of them to to do God's will, to preach his message. They're going to be bold because of this message. This is what, can, can I say this? This is what keeps a preacher going when times get hard. Am I right, Lanny? The gospel of Jesus Christ keeps a pastor going when times are hard, when it seems like there's no fruit, when it seems like nobody's listening to the message, when it seems like the hearers' ears are dull, that's what keeps them going and keeps them from giving up. Necessity is laid upon me. I have a commission from King Jesus to make him known, and I must preach without that sense of obligation Is it really that surprising that when pastors under pressure abandon their ministries or when congregations begin to wonder if their preacher is really invested in the message because the way he acts undermines the message itself? It's no wonder at all, is it? If you could do one thing, and I have a lot of people, I really, I love this church because I have people tell me I'm praying for you. I love that. Would you pray for our elders? Would you pray for me as a pastor that we might live and serve as as stewards of Jesus Christ's gospel, conscious of uh, of the claim that he has on our lives, compelling us, obliging us to preach the gospel in season, out of season, Would you pray that God would put on me a sense of divine compulsion and obligation that I will at all costs fulfill the stewardship given to me by Jesus Christ because without that, please don't miss this, without that, we simply cannot sustain gospel ministry for long. Without that, preaching loses its power and without it, the church, listen to this, The church is absolutely impoverished. And that is why we do not allow ourselves to get distracted at whatever the latest social issue is. The gospel of Jesus Christ is at core of what we do. So Paul talks about the substance of his ministry, the necessity of his ministry, and then he talks about the reward of his ministry. Look at the reward. What's in it for Paul? Let's look at verse number 15. He said, I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. What is he saying? In other words, I am not writing to sort of manipulate you into giving me the very thing that I I seem to be saying I don't need. All right? I'm not trying to manipulate you to give me money. Paul, like I said, Jared's what you see what is what you get. Paul's no different, right? Okay. He said, I'd rather die than to have anybody deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. What are you saying, Paul? I'm going to explain this because I, th- I think it needs to be explained. Is he saying that he took no money from the Corinthians so that he's able to boast about how selfless he is? You know, humble boasting? It's on, it's on, it's on social media all the time, isn't it? You know, if, if, that were, if, if Paul were that kind of a pastor, it'd be something like this. Wanted to go the extra mile for Corinth, refused to take pay, and then he'd hashtag it so selfless. Something like that, right? I don't know what it would be. That's a humble brag. Is Paul flattering himself and looking to get attention and praise the men? Is that what's going on? No, I don't think so. But his boasting, believe it or not, is subversive. Now, if you hold your finger here and turn to 2 Corinthians 11, 2, 
I think we can, we can understand what he's talking about here. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. I'm sorry, 11.30. 11.30. You'll see this principle. He uses the same language, but he uses it in a way I think helps illuminate it. He says this, If I must boast, I will boast of things that show my weaknesses. Right? Now look at chapter 12. In verse number 9, look at 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He says, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness, that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ. Then I am content in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I think that's the same spirit at which Paul is writing here in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. Remember what he's talking about. What is he talking about? He refuses to take a salary and that is costing him. And we're not talking just financially. It's costing him time. Remember what his occupation was? Tent making. And so the time that he was taking to be a tent maker was taking time that otherwise would have been free to minister. Not only that, socially, there was a social cost. He's a tent maker, and so the, the elites in Corinth would despise him and dismiss him, and some of them are probably actively trying to underline, undermine his ministry. And so he's striving to make ends meet, while still having enough emotional, mental, physical stamina and energy to pour himself out into preaching and pastoring. You see? And so that's, so when all, you add all of that up, all of this liability, humanly speaking, Paul is actually imposing on himself limitations that put him at a distinct disadvantage and, and is also stigmatizing his ministry so that when... The gospel advances in Corinth. He's boasting about the power of the gospel and not his ability in ministry. You see? That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? And so when people's lives are changed, the gospel is getting it done. Well, let me ask you a question. Is your confidence in the gospel? As you, as you look at our culture right now, and you look at the church of Jesus Christ, and you look at your own life, where does your confidence lie? I um, have addressed in, in emails to the church from time to time a little bit about the social unrest. And we've actually put out a video or two about some of the stuff going on. And one of the things that I've made sure that we do is point back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I get feedback, um, and, and one of the emails I got, the, the person basically told me, aren't you a little naive to focus on the gospel and not spend time working on these social issues? Because these are big issues. And I've been thinking about this, and it, are the social issues in our nation, are they important? The answer is they are. But if you could volumize importance, let me see if I, we can stick a volume on it. You ready? Eternity is the Atlantic Ocean, and the, the issues surrounding our nation are birdbath in importance. Seriously, I'm not trying to belittle them. Do you think with me, people? Our world is careening headlong into the day of the Lord. That is the most important issue. And what many Christians have done is they're standing on a beach, staring at the birdbath, 
social media or otherwise, telling people, no, you should be on that side of the birdbath. No, you should, you should think this way about this birdbath, about this part of the birdbath. What, meanwhile, the whole world is focused on the birdbath, and if they would turn around, they would see a tsunami of God's judgment of eternal damnation headed straight for them if they do not repent and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how important it is. When people stand before the Lord, whether they're believers or unbelievers, the social unrest in our nation is not going to matter one whit. Not going to matter about social justice, racism, any of this other stuff that people are concerned about right now in our nation. It's not going to matter. I'm going to get right down to where a lot of us live. I'll tell you something else that's not going to matter whether Joe Biden or Donald Trump wins a 2020 election does not matter on the day of judgment. You won't even think about this election when you get there on the day of judgment. And so my plea to us is this. Is your confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek we have this message. Jesus Christ saves. I described, tried with stammering tongue to describe the beauty and the wonder and the awe of it. And this is what we should concern ourselves with. Tell our neighbors about the gospel. And it doesn't matter if they have a red or a blue sign in their front yard. Seriously, it doesn't matter, folks. I, 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 you know what? I need to just quit because I'm going to just start repeating myself. The gospel is so important are you living every day of your life in light that eternity, if you're a believer, is a day on the beach, and eternity, if you're an unbeliever, is a tsunami that will swallow you forever and ever and ever. That's literally the issues that we're dealing with when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I would call us all, put our trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. My heart was full today and yet unsettled knowing there's no way that I can come close to expressing the importance of eternity. Lord, give us a renewed spirit. Forgive us for allowing the gospel to come passe in our life. Forgive us, Lord, for allowing ourselves to stare into the birdbath of the 2020 election. Forgive us for focusing all of our time on the social unrest, being animated by politics and being animated by social issues when, Lord, your day of judgment is coming. Lord, forgive us of that. But at the same time, Lord, give us a heart for your gospel. Fill us with a burning fire that is unquenchable, that we, we must proclaim your message. We must live out that message. And we must live to your honor and to your glory. In Christ's name, amen.